Good day to all of our investors and general listeners. This is the Rudd Commentary. My name is Josh Rudd, and I'll be your host on this presentation today. And also with me today is Jack Herr from our Capital Markets Group to bring us up to date on the state of the financial markets. And later in the program, Jack, we're going to have a special guest. Yeah, that's what I hear. Pretty excited. For our new listeners who may not be familiar with our firm, the Rudd Company is a wealth management firm headquartered in Fort Worth, Texas. We manage investments for successful families and organizations across the country and become your wealth manager, confidant, and personal CFO so you can relax and focus your time and energy on what's important to you. Well, Jack, I'm really looking forward to this program. Is there anything that you've seen that you think is noteworthy? Yeah, Josh, really just one thing over the last week, and that is the Omicron variant of COVID-19 and how it has made its way to the U.S. Just a couple of cases so far, mostly on the West Coast. Reports are that the cases have been pretty mild so far. Of course, this is a big headline and the market is reacting pretty negatively to this news. I think there's a lot of uncertainty still. There's been a lot of big swings in the market. We've seen a lot of volatility. Besides that, we've also had a lot going on behind the scenes. We're still dealing with the inflation. The Fed no longer thinks that this is a transitory issue. So I'd like to give ourselves a pat on the back. We've been talking about inflation for a while now. What we've kind of predicted is it's not going to just last throughout the rest of the year. Those two things are really pulling the market down. In my opinion, I don't think it's all about this variant. I think there's a lot of news that the market is trying to digest. There's still some uncertainty. Obviously, that's going to cause some volatility. Interested to hear your opinion on it. Jack, I think you said it very well and and really hit the nail on the head there. I agree with you 100%. I don't believe the volatility over the last week had everything to do with that most recent iteration of the COVID-19 virus or the recent mania that's kind of gripped our country over the last year. And you said this as well, but I I want to reinforce this and maybe just bring a little more color. It's really over a couple of things. The markets are concerned about pricing of securities, and I believe that this and some other things Jack has given investors a reason to sell. But it really boils down to a couple of things. Many securities are clearly overvalued from a historical perspective. But what has been truly unique about this particular sell-off is twofold. Bonds are, when you look at it, Jack, in a very precarious position based on the lowest yields in history, which I think creates a a big problem. And, And like you said earlier, Jack, inflation fear has now really penetrated the market and is driving up prices of just about every asset class or in many cases, as you and I have discussed, uh, non-asset classes like the NFTs and other things. When you look at these two concurrent realities, you get a lot of financial restlessness among investors, which I believe, Jack, is not only increasing the magnitude of each reaction that we're seeing these days, but more importantly, contributing to the very high prices we have in financial assets. Investors know this, and they're looking for opportunities to hit the sell button. And I believe the latest variant of COVID has been the trigger or catalyst to do that. Josh, I agree. And until we see more certainty with some of these things, I I think we continue to see some volatility in the market heading into 2022. So today we are talking about investing for nonprofit organizations. We're going to cover a lot today, and we will introduce our guest in a few minutes here. But first, I want our listeners to know that we do manage money for nonprofit organizations. Managing money for these types of organizations may be different on the asset management side of things and what strategies we implement, but our service model and overall process largely stays the same. We still have to assess the long-term financial goals, the purpose of the funds, sometimes move money in and out of the accounts, and ultimately be there to give our professional advice on their money or investments. Josh, I know you have a lot of experience with nonprofits, both as an advisor and as a board member. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about this? I'm happy to, and I appreciate you letting me just divert a little bit on this topic. So I do have experience working with nonprofits, both on the legislative side and also with organizations that are focused on helping promote certain social issues, helping certain groups of people, like we'll be talking about veterans a little later in the program today, similar to that. This topic today is very near and dear to my heart. I've seen organizations that are run extremely well, Jack, and unfortunately, I've seen some organizations that struggle and and hopefully Hopefully, we'll get some input from our guest speaker today and give our listeners some great advice and insight into some of the challenges of organizations and also what real successful organizations do. 
But before we move on, you made a comment about our investment process, and I just want to second that. We really enjoy working with these types of organizations here at the Red Company, and part of the reason that I enjoy working with them is the investment policies that we put into place for clients are really the core of what we do for our individual families here at our firm. But our listeners may not realize that our investment policies for our nonprofit organizations are very exciting as well. A lot of that for me is just because they're very values-based. You really get to learn a lot about organizations and how they're benefiting their customers, which are the individuals that they're focused on serving. You get to learn how they work with donors, but these investment policies are usually very clear on what they're trying to accomplish. And that's one of my favorite things for me. The downside of that is the investment policy statement itself. Jack, it can be a little more complicated. A lot of times when you're working with a successful values-based organization, there's a lot of restrictions on how the money can be used, what types of companies that you and I can choose for that organization to invest in. We've got these clear distribution goals, which is a benefit, but a lot of times we don't have our full universe of securities to choose from. So it can be a little more challenging, and that's why we enjoy helping those organizations But one of the things I've noticed when we work with the successful organizations who do their job well, they have a very clear message on what they're doing for their community or the groups that they serve. When we see that, it helps us execute a very clear investment policy. Well, Jack, I think it's time to introduce our special guest for today's program. Yeah, Josh, I've been excited about this one. We are talking to Cody Palmer of Big Country Veterans today. How are you doing, Cody? I'm doing great. Thank you guys for having me today course. Can you tell us a little bit about what your nonprofit does? Sure. Like you said, I'm the executive director for Big Country Veterans. We are a nonprofit organization helping combat veterans kind of conquer life after service again. Thank you guys for having me on today. It's a pleasure to be here and looking forward to discussing the topic of nonprofits today. And we're glad to have you. The first question I wanted to get into is what are some of the long-term financial goals of your nonprofit organization? I think for any nonprofit organization, especially one such as ours that's kind of up and growing, is for one, just to be financially stable, right? To not only be able to fund our mission, and our mission is to help veterans kind of conquer life after combat, but help us grow towards our goals to be able to be sustainable as an organization. That's very, very important for us and our vision to hopefully impact more veterans and more holistically, in our case, you know, coming into their home, helping with their families, those kind of things as well. Cody, you talked about financial stability. What does that mean to you? What are you trying to do more on a financial level? I think from a financial level for us, we have been an organization based upon raising funds for an event that organically found its way to really touch veterans that normally don't seek opportunities with organizations. Through that and through their responses and through their kind of, in essence, kind of call to action for us is to figure out how we can be financially responsible of the funds that are there, not only to provide a great event that allows them to become themselves, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Some of the experiences these guys have seen in combat really changes you know, their perception and reality a little bit. Being able to not only fund that event, but then extend that and be financially stable to help them and their families beyond that is really what we're trying to do as an organization. So a lot of it sounds like, Cody, a lot of the financial challenges that you encounter running a nonprofit are very similar to what a lot of families will just encounter in their own lives, right? That's right. The big difference that I've noticed in my involvement with these organizations, it can be either feast or famine depending Mm. on the economic situation or depending on whether or not you have a a new event or successful venue for that particular year. I'm most interested, and I know our listeners who are contemplating either starting or getting more involved in the nonprofit arena, what are some of the biggest financial challenges that you're facing right now in this environment that we're in? I mean, I know you, sure. your organizations live and breathe by donations, but is there anything unique to this this period that we're going through right now? Well, I think everyone kind of knows the, the elephant in the room a little bit being COVID. COVID has been a challenge for not only for-profit organizations, but especially nonprofit organizations this last year. For us being kind of an event-based organization for most of our funding, it was a challenge at least to get maybe donors to come out and be a part of those events. For us, for example, in 2020, we had to postpone our primary event that we did as an organization and push it on to 2021. And when you look at that, especially small organizations that you know are kind of based around event you know, capital generation, that's challenging. Cody, when you talk about your donors specifically, how much do you rely on large corporate donors versus regular individuals? Sure. I think as an organization, we have been based around kind of small business and individual donors. Our goal as a nonprofit is to obviously capitalize on larger corporations. And we've seen that throughout this last year. And it's really been primarily because of our cause. 
we are really focusing on our passion and a mission as an organization, being that the leader of what we're doing. And we found that it definitely gravitates towards large corporations and their funds that they need to allocate to certain places. Oh, Cody, I'm curious, just on that line, I know that your organization does use investment management services for a portion of the funds that you raise. And tell me, in a perfect world, if we can all think about that right now, in a perfect world, what's the proper balance between fundraising for operating expenses or projects versus maybe longer term funds that could produce income for any organization? That's a great question. I think it's obviously individualized to the organization and what their goals are. I think it takes great vision and leadership to understand that that's an important aspect to focus on as an organization as far as your longevity. Not only funding direct capital for an event, you're going to see almost immediate return versus something that's going to sustain an organization that has a great cause such as Big Country Veterans that can impact multiple lives for years to come. Yeah, we discussed a little bit earlier, Cody, before you came on the program, the differences between sustainable distribution rates for a family that, say, is battling rising health care costs or wants to pass money to the second generation and an organization that wants to continue its mission beyond the lives of the individuals that are leading that organization. One of the real strengths on the asset management side that we have is our investment policy is very clear for organizations like yours. The objectives are very straightforward. Everybody seems to be on the same page. Whereas when you're dealing with individual families and objectives, there's a lot of moving parts and whether or not dad wants a a new Corvette or the kids want to go to TCU, things change over time. But uh, we really enjoy working with those organizations and try to help them find that balance. That's great. Yeah, Josh, and some of those strategies can be pretty specific. I think one of the unique things about our firm is that we can be flexible with those strategies and and to make sure those strategies can attain those long-term financial goals. Oh, Jack, those are good points. And to be more specific for those listening and just that are curious about how those distribution rates are a little different, you know, we talked about that an organization does not have a a defined lifespan, right? You want these organizations like yours to benefit veterans for years and years to come. One of the challenges, though, is also that organization never does die or we don't want it to die. So we really have to look carefully at a a withdrawal rate. For example, when you look at the traditional 4% safe withdrawal rates in portfolios over time, and you compare that to an organization with an indefinite life, we really have to be careful in how we're investing those assets because you've got funds that you're allocating to projects, right? Right. But what happens in the lean years when we may have to tap into some of those investment funds? Um, So really what our firm does is can step in and and, uh, establish a more customized strategy of, you know, distributing more money and in the years where you may need it and less years where you're having great events and you don't have to battle with COVID. Right. So okay. I'm, I'm curious, though, your organization has grown recently and you haven't always had the opportunity to invest funds. When did that change and, you know, what eventually triggered you to look at, you know, hey, we've got funds to invest now and what do we do? For us, the turning point was back in 2019 when you had an opportunity to take over this event fully and kind of co-founded Big Country Veterans and what it is today. And what allowed us to kind of gain those additional funds was just the amazing, generous giving of others. And it started with us just looking back on what we were as an organization and what we were doing this for, and it was for the veterans. And once we turned our focus on that and what these men and women needed, then we saw not only their lives being changed, but you know, potential sponsors, potential donors, really seeing that and getting involved in that, touching a passion in their life that they decided, wow, these guys are doing it for the right reason. And I want to help support them. When that happened, it just allowed for those additional funds to just come flooding in for us. We knew we had a responsibility, not as an organization for the veterans, but for the donors themselves. And so that's why we reached out to the Red Company. And we really appreciate all that you've done so far for us. Well, thank you very much. As you were talking, I'm thinking about the nonprofit work that I've done. Maybe I'd like to get some advice from you guys. Sounds like y'all are doing well. When you budget, for example, from year to year, and you can't always count on those large donations. I'm sure I have listeners that are in nonprofit organizations that are curious on how y'all budget from year to year. What do y'all do in the lean years? How do you determine your budget for a lot of these events and, and just the regular support that you need to provide these great men and women? Do you have any advice that you'd give, say, somebody on the budget committee or somebody taking over? And Sure. Kind of twofold there. I think when you have those great years, understand that is a great year and be aware of what it is, but also don't get 
too far out over your skis. And what I mean by that is understand that funds are great, but a great year could be followed by a lean year. And so understanding what that budget is and not maybe trying to build additional programs or processes that might not be needed at that time, be a little bit more organic in your growth. And I think this has been really successful for us as well as understanding and always being focused in our mission. And, and when we're deciding what we're doing as an organization, yes, we have a board that we go to and we discuss that with, but truly it comes from the customer. And what I mean by that is our veterans. We reach out to our veterans and ask them, what do you need? What do you need from us? And so that has guided us to then make those decisions when we have those good years, where that funding can go and being able to allocate, but also understand that it needs to be controlled growth and have a great understanding of that generosity that was given that year. Well, Jack, it sounds like to me it's not very different from what we do uh, from our individual families as well. It's very interesting to hear your perspective, Cody. I'm curious to know if, if uh, what other challenges have you experienced in the organization in stepping in as executive director? You know, I mentioned COVID. Obviously, that was a challenge, not only for financial reasons and also, you know, event gathering, but it also made a challenge for a lot of organizations from a volunteer standpoint. You know, we weren't able to gather, people weren't able to come and do that. So you kind of lose that uh, quote unquote volunteer army that a lot of organizations require and, and are needed. And we and we're blessed by having them. So that was definitely a challenge, but it also drove innovation, it drove innovation in all sectors, obviously, of the economy, especially the nonprofit world. Um, you're seeing so much what's called nano giving now or nano needs, and that's more like crowdfunding. And you'll see, you know, avenues such as GoFundMe and Kickstarter. And I think you mentioned this on your last podcast, you know, have those five, ten, fifty dollar donations be much more specific and effective versus, you know, I think y'all mentioned writing a five dollar check or twenty five dollar check. Right. And so I think that's where you see that where organizations are now understanding the, the true benefit and the need of social media of really vamping their websites up and CRM platforms, all those kind of things that are out there right now. And so I encourage anyone that's kind of looking into the nonprofit sector right now is to make sure you understand how to capture your audience, be very focused on your mission, and make it very accessible because there's so many tools out there now that can do that. Well, and something else, I mean, you, you brought it up, but that's one of the things that really uh, frustrates, I know us as advisors on the personal side is, when we work with families that don't have a giving plan and they end up giving a lot in the last quarter of every year. Mm -hmm. And what's frustrating is that I feel that those dollars could be more impactful if there was some planning that went into that. And it's good to know that you on the other side of the desk running an organization are planning to give them the opportunity to do that, not just be a part of their planning year to year with great marketing and great events that you have and really communicating where your value is. But then also you talked about accessibility. I mean, for example, I teach a, a night class at a local university here. That's something that these students, even young adults are very interested in. They can give five, 10, $25 if they just know how, and they yeah. know how to get that done. It sounds like we're connecting the uh, folks from our last podcast and this one, Jack, this is a uh, kind of an exciting moment. Is there anything else you want to say in that vein? You know, additionally, as far as challenges for nonprofits right now, you know, we just went through a pretty significant political environment. And even when you see that, too, I think social media influence can, can be huge. And so I think as an organization, you just need to be understanding of who you are and be very clear on that. And always put your mission first. Try not to let outside influence guide you in, in the wrong direction. One of the biggest challenges we see, too, obviously, we talked about kind of a volunteer army. I think when COVID hit, you saw, obviously, a lot of people look more internally on their finances and yep. maybe not give as much to charitable organizations at that time, not only financially, but time. And even position-wise, what I mean by that is, you know, some people that may have had positions in nonprofit organizations finding that that might not be the best place for them during this time financially. And so you've seen a lot of people actually step down from positions from nonprofits. I did the opposite and took a risk and, and went into this nonprofit and took the position of executive director, moved out of the corporate world to chase a passion that I had. And it was because of the experience that I've had with these veterans that drove me to take that leap kind of a faith and I think a lot of small organizations might feel that at the beginning if you let passion lead you I think it's opened up so many doors for me well beyond what I would have seen in the corporate world and just a lot of networking and relationships that are meaningful well beyond I guess anything I could imagine <laughs> to be honest it's been so eye-opening to me but what you've seen a lot of people step down from it unfortunately during this time as well and I encourage anyone that's kind of seeking that or being drawn to that as an individual to do your homework, understand what you're getting yourself into, have a good plan in place, be focused, because 
the best passions and desires are just dreams without action. I'm sure that's extremely appreciated for those that are listening that are considering a move like that. I'd like to go back to what you said earlier about knowing your values and what you're trying to accomplish because we are in a world today that's very polarized and even putting a, this may surprise some of you on our show today, but uh, I do know what a thumbs up is on text or Facebook. <laughs> and even, you know, doing a thumbs up or a like on a comment, you know, can alienate 30, 40, 50% of your audience. Yeah, so it can get you in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I really appreciate that. And so having a very clear message and going back earlier, one of the things we really enjoy about working with organizations like yours is the value proposition and message is to us very simple. We know exactly what you're trying to accomplish. (laughs) And as long as uh, the successful organizations, at least, have a very clear message of who they're trying to benefit. And one like yours is very exciting for us to have the pleasure and opportunity to be a part of. Well, thank you. The Rudd Commentary is brought to you by The Rudd Company. At The Rudd Company, our sophisticated team becomes your proactive wealth manager, your confidant, and personal CFO. So relax and focus your time and energy on what's important to you. Contact us today at rudco at therudcompany.com. That's R-U-D-D-C-O at therudcompany.com. Cody, if you don't mind, I want to go back to one point. You'd mentioned, I think it was back in in 2000, where y'all had some extra funds and made the choice to invest those funds for future needs. Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, why not Why not just uh, do that inside your organization? Why uh, go to a professional? Why come to our firm to do that for you? I'm sure our listeners are interested in you know, your thought process and why you all made that decision. Absolutely. I think for us, that time during COVID when we didn't have our event in 2020, we had that cash that was sitting there in the form of stocks and, and shares. And we obviously came to you because we have a sponsor that that's his way of charitably giving to us. And so we needed a way to transfer those effectively and have his confidence in that. And I knew this was a place to come to, obviously, when that happened. And then when we had that opportunity to you know, move those funds over here uh, or those shares, that it opened up a conversation with you of, so what are we going to do with these? In the past, because we were having to fund an event, we were having to fund organizational operational expenses, we needed those funds. But at the time, it allowed us to kind of sit and reevaluate what we're really doing with those and what a purpose could be with those funds that are sitting there during this time. And that's where we decided to kind of have a further conversation with you to say, what do you recommend, Josh? Like, what are your thoughts on this? Because I see us having an ability to utilize these funds, not for an event in this case, but to further our mission with static capital that could be huge for us moving forward if we do it the right way. I hear you loud and clear, and that comes up in a lot of organizations. Your real interest was, you know, are we going to use this short-term versus long-term? And right. I really appreciate that. I'm curious to know just how important you feel, you know, that long-term investment management of those excess funds is to your organization going forward in general. Oh, I think it's huge. I think for any organization, especially a nonprofit organization, to be cognizant and responsible for the funds that, and the generosity that people give you for the mission that you have, we don't take that lightly. And I think the organizations that understand that are the successful ones. I think so many times, especially as a small nonprofit, you just get caught up in, oh, i got to generate cash to create an event or create you know, uh, support versus let's generate funding to create a true portfolio for an organization that can be long-lasting. And that's where you really came in and really helped open our eyes up to that and see that that blessing in a huge way we're excited to be a part of that here with you and excited for what the future holds with that as we start to continue to grow as an organization i really appreciate that and i know that for organizations like yours also having that investment policy in writing something that's documented something that you can use to plan for the long term but also i would think that would give potential donors a lot of comfort in making those large gifts to your organization in the future. You've done that due diligence. You, you're working with a professional firm. And even if some of those funds aren't going to be used for your projects this year, like you said, they can be used to accomplish your goals in the long term, That's especially it. in those lean years. That's exactly right. I think planning for those lean years, but celebrating the great ones is, is the way to go as an organization, for sure. You've been a big help in that, in that realm for us. Well, thank you. So, Cody, we've talked a lot about investment strategy today, fundraising, the importance of donors. Being a young guy, I'm kind of curious, how did you get started in all this? And how can 
people like me or people who we talked about earlier that want to volunteer, how can they get involved and really get their foot in the door with these types of organizations? Uh, that's an interesting question because if you were to ask me uh, that I would be sitting here talking about running a nonprofit a year ago, I'd be saying you're crazy, right? <laughs> what really got me into it, I kind of have a unique story into that. I'm a physical therapist by trade. And so what I decided to do when I had an opportunity to help out with this organization several years ago, it was primarily due to wanting to just go help at an event. I was helping transfer some of these guys, some of our veterans obviously are missing limbs, things like that. I wanted to donate my time for a cause that I believed in. And as I started to do that, I started to find depth in this organization well beyond that I ever expected. And I think for any young individual that maybe is considering moving into the nonprofit sector, start with that. Go out, find a passion that you have, figure out a way to get involved with it and donate what really is probably the most valuable thing is your time. Figure out if it's something that you're passionate about well beyond that and really start understanding what the organization is about. And then you never know what kind of opportunity will come, just like with me with this past year, having the opportunity to step into that executive director role for this organization was not something necessarily that I, in essence, planned, but the cause in itself created that. And me just being a part of it allowed me that opportunity to just kind of slip in. And I knew the organization so well because I've been a part of it so long. I knew the mission. I knew where we were going as an organization. And it just allowed that transition to happen so smoothly. Well, Cody, thank you very much for your time today. I really enjoyed this, just learning a little bit about really the executive management, the administration of the nonprofit side. We know a lot of work goes into that, but uh, obviously a lot more than I realized. I'm sure our listeners are, are very interested, like I am, to learn a little more about your organization. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and how to contribute if we're interested in reaching out. Well, Josh, thank you again so much for this opportunity to be here today. Speaking on behalf of Big Country Veterans, we're a nonprofit organization focused on the honor and support of those that have sacrificed so much for our country. And our mission is kind of based around promoting awareness of those sacrifices and fostering healing environments to transform wartime experiences that these guys have had into a little bit more positive memories for them and their families. Just as our kind of motto states, Semper Invictus, which for those that might not know means always unconquered, we're dedicated to really helping veterans conquer life after their service and, and specifically after combat. We focus our efforts on combat veterans, specifically special forces operations. And the types of events that we create for them are, are pretty unique in the fact that it recreates some of maybe the activities and things that they were doing during service. And one of those being a helicopter hawk hunt that we do every year. Specifically, what really got me in and really hooked me into this organization was the fact that these veterans would come out. And we had one specifically this last year. He actually helped organize the veterans that came, but then didn't show up the first day because he's never been to one of these, and he didn't really feel like it was something that he felt comfortable coming to because of the experience he's had. After the first night, the guys called him and said, you, gotta, you have to come here, and he showed up the next day. This specific gentleman was in Special Forces for over 20 years. For one instance, shot, shot 11 times and um, broke his neck jumping off a three-story building to escape Afghani fire uh, while he was trying to save some fellow warriors that didn't make it. That experience that he had out there, he came up and told me afterwards, he's like, man, this saved my life. This is something that there's not enough of out there. All it is is honestly being humble, being genuine, and being passionate about caring for those that have done so much for this country that we're not even aware of. And all we do, in essence, is create an environment where they feel welcomed, where they feel like they can be themselves, where they feel like they're not judged, and it allows them to kind of, in essence, hit a reset button and understand that it's okay to integrate back into civilian life. There's really good people out there that can do that. There's good organizations that I can get involved in, and I don't have to do this all myself anymore. That's what's really drove us as an organization, listening to these guys that have these testimonials afterwards and say, let's do more. Let's use the funding. Let's use the opportunities that the Red Company allows us to have, too. Well, I want to thank you, Cody, uh, for that. I, I had no idea. What I'm taking away from this is the organization really serves a group of individuals that serves an important purpose and highly specialized, but unfortunately are often forgotten That's right. in our society today. I just want to thank you for the work that your organization does and for all the hard work that you've done. 
if we have a, a listener or a group of listeners that's interested to know uh, more about your organization, how would they contact you? Do you have a website or some information that you can provide our listeners? Now, better with after all those comments I made earlier, right? Yes, we have a website. It's uh, www.bigcountryveterans.org. You can also look us up on Facebook at Big Country Veterans, and same thing on Instagram. This is Big Country Veterans, all one word. On When's your next camp. event, Cody? So our next big event is in April, uh, April 21st through the 24th. Anyone that wants to maybe consider being a sponsor for that event, like I mentioned, that's our annual helicopter hog hunt. As a sponsor, you get to interact and fly with the veterans that come out. So not only are you coming out to just an amazing event, you get to sponsor a veteran coming out there to that event to have that eye-opening, hopefully, experience that we have and be directly involved in that. You get to sit in the helicopter with them. You get to listen to the comms as they talk. We also have a gun range that's out there. We have axe throwing competitions. We just have a nice. It sounds like a. It, it sounds like a fun and a very familiar environment. For, yeah. <laughs> for a lot of great. Yeah, guys. a lot of those guys are just a lot of events that they relate to, and they can just be themselves, and just a really just fun time. Well, I want to thank you for your time on our program today, Cody. And I'm sure if we have any listeners out there that are interested in supporting, they'll visit your website. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Jack, that was an excellent topic for us to have on our program today, and I really hope it added some value to some of our listeners, not just that are thinking about donating to a nonprofit, but also those who are thinking about getting into the nonprofit arena. I think you gave some great insight on how to get involved and to get your foot in the door in some of these organizations. Again, if any of our listeners are interested in learning more about Cody Palmer's organization, please visit Big Country Veterans' website. I know they also have that event coming up. And always, I'd just like to thank our listeners for joining us today for this program. Please send us feedback on any topics that you'd like to hear going forward. We'd appreciate hearing from you. And also, please like our podcast or share it with others on your preferred social media platform. As always, thank you for joining us for the Red Commentary today, and invest long and prosper. This commentary is distributed for informational purposes only and is not intended to constitute legal, tax, accounting, or investment advice. Nothing herein constitutes any offer to sell or solicitation of any offer to buy any security. All investment strategies and investments involve risk of loss, including the possible loss of principal invested, and nothing herein should be construed as a guarantee of any specific outcome or profit. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Any opinions expressed by employees of the Red Company are the Red Company's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of any affiliates. The opinions expressed by guest speakers are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Red Company or any affiliates. Guest appearances on this program does not imply the Red Company's endorsement of any entity, person, product, service, or investment. All opinions are current and only as of the date of recording and are subject to change without notice.